school. And uh, I was here on Saturday. We had a wonderful exchange of ideas about how we, in the richest nation of the world, um, manage not to see our responsibility to make sure that all God's children have bread enough and to spare. I want to thank Bread for the World for giving me the privilege to go all across the nation for most of this year, preaching everywhere I went about God's call to us to be instruments of the divine will that all God's children would find the nourishment necessary for the good life. I want to thank the faculty members who allowed the students to come today. I am fully aware that this is not your usual day for chapel, that you just gathered to accommodate our effort at Bread for the World to make sure that our seminaries are also <coughs> centers celebrating and also strengthening the ministers to go forth to be able to know that the bread we share is not simply the Holy Word, but it is the bread that keeps our bodies strong so that we can act upon the Word when it has been heard. Now, my task here today is to share with you the sermon that has started to emerge as the, the one sermon that I'm going to preach every chance I get. I want to call your attention to some verses from Luke's Gospel, beginning to read at chapter 8, verse 40. I will read with you verses, and then I will share with you the ideas that have come to me about feeding hungry. I want to thank Erica for our mailing forge together as a team in the leadership of worship and how blessed and grateful the world is to have you and I see in you the potential of extraordinary leadership. We just don't know where it's going to end up, but we know that you are on your way and to God be the glory. Luke 8, beginning at verse 40. Um, my thinking right now before I read this text is that those of you who are sitting right here, because I, I think I'm not even going to be using this mic unless you are recording. If you if you are, uh, you might need me to be near the mic. Otherwise, I'm going to go. You are recording, therefore I may have to discipline myself to stay somewhere close to home base. Just then, there came a man named Jairus, a leader of the synagogue. He fell at Jesus' feet and begged him to come to his house. For he had an only daughter, about 12 years old, who was dying. As he went, the crowd pressed in on him. Now, there was a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years, and though she had spent all she had on physicians, no one could cure her. She came up behind him and touched the fringe of his clothes, and immediately her hemorrhaging stopped. Then Jesus asked, Who touched me? When all denied it, Peter said, Master, the crowds surround you and press in on you. But Jesus says, someone touched me. For I noticed that power had gone out from me. When the woman saw that she could not remain hidden, she came trembling and falling down before him. 
she declared in the presence of all the people why she had touched him and how she had been immediately healed. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. I'd like to stop at that section and I'll come back to this text in just a moment. But the fascinating thing about this text is that Jesus reveals how exceedingly sensitive he is to human need. His disciples thought that it was actually weird of him given such a large crowd around him to inquire who touched him. Jesus explained, there's something about me that many of you may not know. And that is, when I am touched by deep need, crying out for grace and mercy and healing and hope without having to think about it. My body is organized, is configured such that when that, that deep need out of anguish with a cry for mercy and hope and grace and healing, there's something that goes out from me. And just now, I felt that. I'm not talking about every time somebody bumps up against me. I'm not talking about that. Nor am I simply talking about when somebody wants to touch the teacher. I'm talking about when there is deep need that reaches out with a cry, Lord, have mercy. Let your healing grace respond to my desperation. Something comes out. The reason I would have preferred a longer, a longer uh, uh, extension cord uh, is because I really wanted to start out today just walking and let my walk symbolize Jesus passing through. Because even in the seminary it's possible that somebody in there on their way to help others may nevertheless have within themselves a cry out of deep need, asking, petitioning, grant me grace and mercy. Have mercy, Lord. Yes. And because, because somebody in here today, while I'm here to talk on behalf of bread for the world, the, why bypass the folks that's in here? If you have a need, that's a deep need, that is crying out for Lord have mercy, for, for, for a healing touch, yes. for a transformative visitation. You need to know, like the old folks who said, Jesus on the main line. <laughs> tell them what you want. But even if you can't tell them, I just dare you, reach out when he's passing through. Oh, that that's not that's not preliminary talk. That's the, that's the heart of the sermon right there. Mm -hmm. Except that you remember the conversation and I, I hate to mess up the audio visual possibility but <laughs> you know, I'll come back and do a sermon on the, on the tape another time. And what happened is remember when all of this happened, Jesus was on his way to Jairus' house. Yes. Yes. He had a daughter that was about 12 years old. Fascinating that the daughter, 12 years old, has now come to the place that her life is ending. 
having noticed that the woman that touched Jesus had been sick for 12 years. Mm. That, 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 that's as long as this woman had been sick. Now, here this daughter has been alive, but now her life is being snatched away by death. And Jesus is on the way to Jairus' house, and as he is moving along, gets interrupted by this temporary healing miracle for the woman who had been sick all these years. But while he's moving, somebody comes up and says to, to the messengers, uh, don't you all bother the teacher anymore because um, it is too late now. Uh, this daughter is already dead. Don't, mm -hmm. don't trouble him anymore. Whereupon Jesus says, oh no. If you can just believe and have faith, uh, she she can be saved. So 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 don't don't give up. I'm still going. I, I know you have decided that it's too late, but it's never too late. May not come when you want, but he's on time. So Jesus keeps going, and when he gets to the house, there's a great commotion. Mm. And the commotion is the usual way that community gathered in the time of loss. Actually, there were professional mourners, and there were the stylistic forms of grief that always took place. And, and Jesus saw them, and he said to them, listen, you all, she, she's just sleeping, and they, they stop mourning long enough to laugh. You're not the crazy, man. The child is dead. Jesus says, no, she's just sleeping. But, but sensing the absence of belief about what he was getting ready to do, Jesus acknowledges the significance of context. If the context is full of doubt and unbelief, it can in some way hamper the healing possibilities. And therefore, Jesus does not allow anybody to go in the house but just James and Peter and John and the mother and the father. And when, when he's there, he grabs the daughter by the hand and says, Child, get up. Child, get up. And her spirit returned to her, and she is now up again. And the mother and the father hug her. They're just, oh, Jesus, Jesus. And, and Jairus, the, the, the ruler of the synagogue, I, I, I imagine he got on a shot. Oh, my daughter, my daughter is back again. Oh, praise God. Prayer upon Jesus. Instead of accepting the accolades and the, and the celebration, Jesus suggests by his action that although I have performed this miracle, in fact, I, I performed one all the way. In fact, I performed one with the garrisons even before I got here. In fact, even before I had come there, I went to Nain and, and lifted up a boy. And even before that, when I was at Capernaum, I, I healed again. And, and, but, but, but no, the, the miracle has not yet been complete. For the miracle of life is not complete. You cannot restore life fully. Unless, unless something has happened, which is what I was, would have talked about a long time. But, but you know what happened? Jesus, while they were up there jumping and carrying on praising God about all of this, Jesus says, no, the text doesn't say Jesus says. But my text, revised standard verse, says Jesus directed them. You know, who is the Greek professor around here? Well, well the Greek, what, 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 what would the Greek root be to this? It doesn't sound like it's just a minor detail that he says, oh, oh now she's up, y'all have anything for eat? No, it says he directed her. Directed them. Directed them how? Give her something to eat. Now that I'm about over three quarters of the way of my sermon, I want to let you know what I was going to be talking to you about. But I really wanted to, all this was just building up to the issue of this idea that he directed them to give her something to eat. But I want to know from you, do you imagine this is only a minor detail? Or is this a divine mandate? Mm. That's the issue. Mm. That's the issue. Mm. 
You know how we preachers can sometimes lift up a word out of the narrative and build a whole schema around it. Like the preacher that says, my sermon today is entitled Now, coming from Now Faith is the Substance of Things. You know, no, my sermon today is here. <laughs> if my people, if my people. <laughs> so, so you ought to be suspicious of me. Is he just taking these words out of context just because Bishop Williams is up in here yes. and, and, and because Ford Desirable is up in here? No, 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 no. no. That's, I, I want you to wrestle with it. You wrestle with it. You've got a Bible, brother. You don't be asking me. I'm asking you. Is it? just a minor detail or is it a divine mandate you give her something to eat mm -hmm. now what bible is this you got here <laughs> uh, that, that ought to work <laughs> i want you to to turn over to chapter nine okay and then, you've already heard it read here, but we're going to do it again. Uh, just read from the, the, the 12th chapter, the 12th verse up here. Stand up, stand up. Yeah, yeah, come on, just read it. Because, because, because this brother is suspicious. He thinks it's just a minor detail. And it's almost as if God allowed the writers to put this together in such a way that the question that I'm raising out of the 8th chapter gets answered without any equivocation in the ninth chapter. In fact, let me give you a little humor word to kind of break the tension on this thing. You know what? A little teacher asked a little girl, little girl, said, said class, do you all know the meaning of the word benign? And the little girl thought for a while. She said, yeah, I, I think I know this word. What is it? She said, she said, benign is what you be after you've been eight. You <laughs> see? Now, what I'm trying to, I'm only doing this to say, I want you always to remember Luke chapter eight. And then you go to nine and read what it says in nine. In response to the question, is it just a minor detail or is it a divine mandate? Read what it says in the Read it loud so they can hear it. Late in the afternoon, the twelve came to him and said, send the crowd away so they can go to the surrounding villages and countryside and find food and lodging because we are in a remote place here. He replied, you give them something to eat. They answered, we have only five loaves of bread and two fish, unless we go and buy food for all this crowd. Above 5,000 men were there. But he said to his disciples, have them sit down in groups of about 50 each. The disciples did so, and everyone sat down, taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven. He gave thanks and broke them. Then he gave them to the disciples to distribute to the people. They all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. Thank you. Yes, sir. Now, is there anybody here who's confused as to whether it is a minor detail or whether it is a divine mandate? Is there anybody in here who thinks that the issue of feeding is just, a, you know, a kind of a normal day-to-day -day issue that Jesus is concerned about? I think that this text right here that just simply reinforces what was said in the last one. First one was give her something to eat. And in this one it said, you, you seminarians, you preachers, you folks who call yourselves religious leaders who are indifferent to the fact that a nearly a billion people don't have any food around the world. And that in the United States of America, one out of five children live in families that do not have food security. And you think there's a minor detail? How on earth could you believe that? You haven't had your Bible study. You haven't been to Sunday school. Because if you're just a Sunday school student, you would probably know that in the first chapter of the Bible, Genesis, by verse 29, God said, you see all these plants, these seed-bearing plants? All of these are for food. I think you all need to know that even before we develop, God had already prepared food for us. Isn't that amazing that God understands?
sad, even if we know that there is no life to be sustained apart from food, or we may fast for three days, or even Jesus didn't afford it, but if you fast for long and don't have food, you're on your way to the graveyard. Don't you understand that God from the very beginning said, as I give life, it would not make sense. I would be a cruel monarch to give life and then not to give food. You've got to have food where there is life. If you give life and you don't have any food, then guess what? It's going to be over very soon. In fact, are you a mother, man? Are you a mother? Are you, are you, who, who, you, your mother, you, 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 where's the mother? Where's the, I, I need a real mother. Who's a real mother? Oh, here's a mother. Are you a mother? Let me explain to you. This may seem strange to you, but the fact is that God is so insistent that every child that comes down the birth canal will have food to eat. That God has arranged that even though the birth may take place in the middle of the night and the stores are closed and maybe the cupboard is bad, but God says, I can't handle it. I can't stand it. Into the world, and there be no food. Therefore, God said, I'm going to let a species develop that will reveal my, ne my the necessity of food, and I'm going to call them mammon. But why do you call them mammon? Because I tell you why they call them mammon. The, 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 the woman who gives birth is also granted mammon. I know you all don't talk about mammon. We have decided that that means something is all caught up in, 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 in how beautiful, how charming, how feminine. No, that's, that, that's a secondary consideration. You know, important consideration, but a secondary consideration. Mammary gland is about God saying, when that child comes forth, I want to make sure that there is food. Because if the child is born and there's no food, then, 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 then the metabolism is already turning its way to death. And Jesus has said, I've come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. There ain't no abundant life if there's no food. Every child in this United States and around the world who is without food this night, God is upset about it. And Jesus is feeling that he's calling into question his true prophet, because they say what a prophet says comes to pass. In fact, don't you know, we specialize in food that we call spiritual food. That's our specialty. Blessed are they that do hunger and thirst after righteousness. They shall be filled. Thank God the Lord allowed another gospel to come up, because Luke doesn't put it that way. Luke said, blessed are you who are hungry now. You shall be filled. The question I want to know, if Jesus said that they were going to be filled, how come they hungry? How, why are they hungry? I, I think they're hungry because we think it's a minor detail and we don't know that it is a divine mandate. Oh, all through the Bible, you can see it happening. Don't clean the field. It's in, the, it's in your call to worship. And, and where there is an absence of food, you need to know that that's where God actually shows a special concern because there is the devil who is an agent provocateur who goes around teasing God all the time. In fact, when the children of Israel were out in the wilderness and, and they ran out of food, the devil comes slamming up about me and saying, hey God, you the great liberator will look like you got a logistical problem. You got all these people out here in the wilderness. They don't have water to drink and they don't have food to eat. And the Lord couldn't stand. The Lord can stand a situation where there is no food to eat. Right. Mm -hmm. And then when God is insistent and to des desiring to show special intensity and concern, it often takes the form of miracle. That's why he said, strike the rock, and water started coming forth. That's why he said, look on the ground, and there's man on the ground. Look up, there's quail in the air. Oh, that's why when they ran out of wine at the, at the wedding feast, that's why God says, I, I just want to use this as a time to reveal the nature of the mission of the Messiah. The Messiah's job is to provide prayer that is not enough. And I think I want to make it like this. God is so concerned that we don't forget food. And I'm now about ready to end. God's so concerned that when the disciple says, Master, teach us how to pray. Notice how he said, Our Father, you know the Lord. Come on now. Which are in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And what else? Give us this day. Every day. I can never Don't even pray without mentioning food. And 
And, uh, and if there is no food for everybody, then that is a critique of the culture. If there's not food for every child in the United States, somebody has been tampering with God's intention. If there is not a food for enough people, somebody has been hoarding something that belongs to somebody else. Where is it? Who is it in here that, 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 that's hoarding the food that the hungry ought to be having? Could it be preachers who have forgotten the centrality of the word of God about spiritual food that the nourishment of the body? Are we hoarding? We got a whole Bible full of stuff about food, and you and I are hoarding. Oh, oh, dear, you cannot let, I, 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 I fight against you. You cannot let one of these students graduate from Howard University School of Theology, and they have not become aware that they are called upon to provide the food for the hungry. Mm -hmm. Don't you let them out of here thinking that all they're going to do is hoom and toom. <laughs> I'll explain to you. Come on, Dave. I need you. Come, come. I want to explain this to you. The reason that you all can't go out of this seminary without becoming champions for the feeding of the hungry in the land is because some of you have forgotten the fact. Y'all come on, Dave. You come on, Dave. You come on, Dave. Y'all have forgotten about the fact. And I wonder why we are so slack in our New Testament theology that we need these little details and don't even remember them. I don't want anybody in here to, to be unaware of that. Don't you know that this brother who read from the New Revised, from the, the, the New International Version of the Bible, he said that there were 12 baskets left over. And nobody in here has asked me, what did they do with the 12 baskets? Nobody even worried about the 12 baskets. You so full of yourself that you are not worried about the 12 baskets. <laughs> to say to the disciples, I'm here now, and I have lifted the bread, and I have asked God to touch it, and now that these things are here, I'm going to leave you. In fact, I will not eat again with the fruit of the vine until that day is in the devil. But in the meantime, I have left these 12 baskets for you all so that you can go out and distribute them. Don't you understand? Yes. Therefore, you want to know what happened to the 12 baskets? Yes. The 12 baskets were put in a reserve. That's what the Roman Catholics do when they don't use all the Eucharist. They put it in a little reserve tabernacle somewhere until the, the, the 12 baskets are here. This is not the Eucharist ash on Sunday morning. This is what I was talking about when I said God has given every preacher wonder bread. This is this is <laughs> this is my hope for you to hear. Now let me tell you something. You know what I wish would happen? I wonder if it could be. Are you a day yet? You might. Will you be a day? Let me, I wonder, if we ordain her, if somebody walks up and says, here's a road, a road that the van has, and then somebody comes up and says, now here's a stole that you can have, and somebody else could get up there and say, now here's the hymn book, and a lot of hymns are amazing grace, how sweet the sound, and then everybody come up and here's a Bible, this is a word of God, and by this shall all be. Suppose the last one would be, now that you are about to be, we have gone into the reserved time, and you are called upon to preach the spiritual word. But don't you dare preach the spiritual word without remembering that the baskets left over were reserved for you. Yeah. 
my sermon. My sermon ends by saying, God has left those fragments for us. And woe unto us if we hoard those fragments or ignore them or leave them aside while our children die. Every child that dies may be their last breath will be the occasion of a judgment on us. Oh, rather than that, if you've been hungry and God has fed you, I, 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 can, I, I can tell. I can tell because if you've really been filled with, with God's bread, then you want to do it, not because you're scared you're going to be judged. And I'll tell you, this is the last text. Don't let anybody out of here tell you anything. I, I know I don't, I'm not on the board of directors, but in addition to this bread, because I know the bread will easily be hoarded up, uh, Ammonites and the fire make that very wet. What you want to do is don't let any student out of here unless they are filled with the Holy Ghost. Now, mm -hmm. you've got to make sure that they go by Acts chapter 2, part 1. Hello. Down, but Acts chapter 2, part 2, is they went from house to house and breaking bread and sharing what? When the Holy Ghost gets it. And God feeds you with bread from heaven. There's something in you that says, Have you tasted the bread? Let me share. One the bread with you. So, you got the bread. Have you been touched by the Holy Ghost? This year. Feed me to our Lord. Bread. Feed me to our Lord. As we eat the bread, this is not Holy Eucharist today. This is Holy Mandate that you and I do. Give me a piece of the bread. Preach, preach. There's some child out there in the world for whom this little piece right there would be more than they had in the they would have. Oh, praise God. Well, I've got a feeling that's going to be okay. Yeah. That we are going to become a church that will take upon ourselves the mission of feeding the hungry. And just like the disciples of old, we won't have enough to do this, but we're going to ask our government. There we go. We're going to ask our government to take some of our tax money and stop spending it on ballistic missiles and all that stuff and make sure that all the children have bread to eat. And by the way, while you're here, ma'am, you're a teacher because you taught in the class of it. Go down to the Capitol and tell those congresspersons that if they are trying to debate and don't know what to do, that you know what to do. They are trying to debate whether the food stamp program should end by cutting out four million, four, four, how much? Four billion? Four billion. Well, four billion is what the House, what, is what the Senate is talking about. But the House is saying 40 billion. Y'all trying to figure out what to do? You tell them, let me go into your Congress and let me tell them that you need to be aware of the fact that you may have the limits. If you hold this way, it could be that the day will come that you will not have an appetite for it. So that if you want America to be a great nation, it must at least prove that we don't all have to have seven houses. We don't all have to have great, great uh, cars and all that. Tell them, feed the hungry, and you'll discover how really great America is. And America is not as great as it ought to be. Mm. All God's children have bread, 